James Bovard. James Bovard is the author of 10 books, including Public Policy Hooligan, Attention, Attention Deficit Democracy, The Bush Betrayal, and Lost Rights, The Destruction of American Liberty. He's written for the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Playboy, the Washington Post, New Republic, Reader's Digest, and many other publications. And he's also a, contribu a contributing editor for American Conservative Magazine and a regular contributor to the Future of Freedom Magazine. The Wall Street Journal, called Bovard, the roving inspector general of the modern state, the New York Times tagged him an anti czar czar and the Washington Post uh, called him a one-man truth squad. His writings have been publicly denounced by the chief of the FBI, the Secretary of Labor, the DEA, FEMA, as well as the Sierra Club, the American Civil Liberties Union, and the Washington Post. Thanks. Anyone who's been denounced by such high-profile organizations deserves your attention, and now he has it. So please join me in welcoming James Bovard to the stage. Let's see if this works. Thanks very much for those kind words. I appreciate that. It's always fun to hear the list of people that hated my work. <laughs> It's a long list, but what the hell. Uh, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm honored to be speaking here in New Hampshire, to be talking to groups, talk, talking to a bunch of individuals who are actually doing something positive for freedom. Because most of the time, most of the folks, most of the groups I talk to around the country, they kind of like, yeah, the government's gone to hell. You know, things are getting bad. But here are folks who have taken the courage and taken the initiative and putting their lives on the line to a degree to push back and to try to uh, secure their freedom once again, to, to try and do whatever is necessary. And it's great that people are paying attention, paying attention to the, what the things the governments are doing. But um, I have to admit, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit nervous you know, being here because um, I've been reading up about what the uh, government drone policy is, and um, they, they have all these different standards to justify killing people. And, and, and one of them is that uh, the, the person who was killed was in proximity to a known militant. And I kind of suspect that there might be some known militants in this audience. Uh, you know, I mean, it, it could put me in a bad light. You know, I, you know I've, I've, I've gotten so nervous about these drones that, you know, every time I see a wedding party, I think, you know, holy shit, you know, this, 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 this could be bad. So... Now, thinking about how Obama has changed the relationship of the American people to the federal government, two simple questions. How much evidence should the U.S. government be obliged to show before it kills an American citizen? None, according to the Obama administration. And how much evidence should the government be, allowed, uh, be obliged to possess of an American's wrongdoing before it officially targets him for killing? That's a secret, according to Obama. And this is the, 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 the Obama administration is pioneering these pretexts for presidential killings. The drone assassinations have increased more than 500% since Obama took office. And, and, and Obama is claiming openly in public rights that George W. Bush only claimed secretly. That's how bad it's gotten. Now, the, uh, the first target, the first official admitted target, American citizen target, for killing was a, a, a guy born in New Mexico, a Muslim cleric, Anwar al -Aki. Shortly after the 9-11 attacks, he was showcased as a, a moderate Muslim. I mean, he was invited to a prayer breakfast on Capitol Hill. He, he spoke at the Pentagon. He was trotted out for New York Times interviews. But as the George Bush war on terror went on, uh, this guy got convinced that the, that the America was leading a war on Islam, not a war for freedom. And, he was, uh, the thing he did is went, to, uh, he was pressured to become a U.S. government informant. Uh, there were all kinds of twists and turns the FBI did. He wouldn't do it. Instead, he went to Yemen. Uh, U.S. government pressured the Yemen government to lock him up. He was in prison for like 18 months. He may have been tortured there. And by the time he got out of prison, he had a really bad attitude. 
Uh, but what you know, but but what the government did when they announced uh, in early 2000 in 2010 that they were targeting this guy for killing, they said he was linked to the Fort Hood massacre, to the attempt to blow up an airline on Christmas Day coming from Holland, two or three other things. They never provide any evidence, but it was a, a list of allegations. Um, and once and and as soon as the U.S. government um, announced publicly announced their plans to kill this guy, his father hired a lawyer to try to challenge it in federal court. And his lawsuit was joined by the American Civil Liberties Union, and what the ACLU tried to do was compel the government to, to disclose the legal standard it uses to place U.S. citizens on government kill lists. The, uh, but the Obama people kept saying it's a state secret. Everything's a state secret. That meant that the uh, Obama people did not even have to explain why U.S. law did not prevent the president from killing Americans anymore. There was a, uh, this was going back and forth in the court cases. Uh, one Justice Department lawyer, Douglas Letter, announced in court that no judge had the legal authority to be looking over the shoulder of Obama's killing program. And most, uh, because he said that's the very core powers of the president as commanders in chief. I mean, you know, a, a lot of people thought this BS was over when Dick Cheney left Washington. <laughs> but this is the same level of absurdity and authoritarianism that we had before. And unfortunately, there was, there was a, a, a federal judge who heard this case basically said, yep, this is, um, th th this targeted killing was outside the court's jurisdiction. Why the hell do we pay lawyer, uh, uh, pay judges? If, if the judges can't say, well, no, the, the government can't be killing Americans unless they, like, maybe, um, you know, have some evidence. But it, it was a very, it was a devious way that Obama people did it because they were very careful not to indict the guy. There were never any formal charges. And by doing that, it made it far more difficult for him, for his relatives and the ACLU to challenge, challenge the course and challenge it uh, in court. Uh, so a while later, September, the uh, U.S. tried a couple drone strikes to kill this guy that they missed. September 2011, they finally killed him. And later that day, Obama went to a U.S. military base, base in, in Virginia and bragged about the killing. And his administration people were just kind of boasting left and right about this great, this great crime of killing this, this guy over in Yemen, this American in Yemen. Uh, two weeks later, the, the U.S. also killed his 16-year-old son blew him up when he was sitting outside at a cafe in Yemen. And there was an a, a Obama administration official said, well, he was, he was 21 years old and he was a member of Al-Qaeda. No, it turned out that the Washington Post got his birth certificate, born 16 years earlier in, in Denver, Colorado. But it didn't matter because he was the uh, son of the uh, guy the U.S. wanted to kill. Now, it's, what Obama has said is that these, these drone attacks are only targeting uh, you know, kingpins for the terrorist groups for Al Qaeda and closely linked groups, but that's that's the standard they're using might be of interest to the people in this group, because uh, uh, NBC News got some of the classified documents, and it turned out 25 percent of all the people killed in the drone strikes in Pakistan a couple years ago were classified as other militants. Other militants, they had no idea who they were, what group they were with. Uh, what sort of ties they had, uh, and there was no evidence that they had they, they were a threat to national security. There was a, there was a phrase the New York Times had, uh, the uh, Obama people talked to them, and the, uh, the uh, Times noted that, that the U.S. counterterrorism officials insist that, that people, in an, uh, people in an area of known terrorist activity are probably up to no good. And, that was their blanket justification for killing these people. And they have other standards as well. For instance, they've, they, they basically uh, recycled the rules of engagement from Ruby Ridge. Ruby Ridge, you might recall, 1992, the, the FBI snipers went there, and the FBI snipers were told they could kill any adult who was uh, seen outside, uh, outside the cabin with a gun. The Obama people are using the same standard in certain parts of the world. Any, uh, 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 any adult male who's carrying a gun is presumed to be a terrorist suspect and it's okay to kill them. 
And, and with, these, with these drone surveillance, uh, just in case they happen to see uh, two guys out there doing target practice, well, it's not target practice, it's a terrorist training exercise. And therefore, it's justified to kill them. And it's amazing how little controversy that this has evoked here in the US. There have been some people, mostly on the left side of the spectrum, that have done a very good job of attacking this. Glenn Greenwald's been great on this. Uh, some of the uh, interest groups and uh, some of the nonprofit groups in DC have been very good. But to see these precedents being set, and it's, you know, people haven't realized how this changes everything. For instance, if the power to kill Americans remains in the White House arsenal, then perhaps the, the, the rhetoric for future presidential races should be changed. For instance, instead of listening to, the, listening to hear the candidates promise you new benefits, citizens should focus instead on, on which candidate seems least likely to kill them or their family members. <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, 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 perhaps, perhaps, we'll hear, perhaps we'll hear campaign slogans like, vote for Smith, he won't have you killed unless all of his top advisors agree you should die. <laughs> but unfortunately, as with other campaign promises, there is no way to make the politicians uphold their promise. But nowadays, it may be that the, the only right Americans still possess is the, first Americans, uh, is the First Amendment's forgotten right of petition. If the government tries to kill you and fails, then you can write a letter complaining to your congressman. <laughs> If the government succeeds when it tries to kill you, then your next of kin can write that letter. <laughs> Except that protesting the killing might get them added to the kill list. This is how it was in the Soviet Union. Now, looking at other ways, a lot of people expected a fundamental change when Obama became president. Because there was the, you know, there was an onus about some of the stuff that, well, John Ashcroft, what else do I need to say? There, uh, you know, he was odious. He was an odious, uh, there was a, uh, his testimony in two months after 9-11, three months after 9-11, that, th that those who frighten Americans with the phantoms of lost liberties are giving aid and comfort to the enemy. That resonated with me, because I was trying to frighten people with those phantoms. Uh, <laughs> but it was this, I mean, but you thought it would be different with Obama, but uh, another way that things have gotten a lot worse with Obama is with the TSA. Uh, this is, again, this is, this is an agency created by Bush, but, but Obama's made it far worse. One of the agency's first mottos was dominate, intimidate, and control. And the, uh, and the Obama administration has taken the TSA and, he's, and he's made, uh, they've made it much, much worse. But TSA agents are far more adept at looting travelers than protecting them. More than 400 TSA agents have been fired after they were caught robbing people. There was, there was a TSA security officer at Newark Airport who was arrested after he was caught selling on eBay a camera he fills from a CNN news correspondent's bag. <laughs> now, if he'd been a little bit smarter, he might have taken the CNN tag off the camera <laughs> before he put it on sale. But um, he, was, uh, um, he was caught at the time and he was selling 80 different cameras and laptops on eBay. The TSA just did not, was not paying any attention to this, and uh, to this guy's credit, he served time, and then he came out and he said, it was very convenient to steal. It was very commonplace. Uh, the, the, there, uh, uh, down at Orlando, a TSA screener confessed to stealing 80 laptops, 80 laptops from travelers. A TSA agent in uh, Fort Lauderdale stole $50,000 from travelers in six months, and he was only arrested after he was caught with an iPad in his pants. You know, it's always, it's always kind of suspicious if, if you see a TSA agent with an iPad in his pants, you know, because he's probably not happy to see you. Now, and so, so what the TSA, you know, did to make things worse, in 2010, they started to roll out their whole body scanners. They, they, uh, they, were, they were trying to find a techno technological silver bullet, and so they just figured that giving every that every uh, traveler a big dose of radiation would somehow make people feel better or at least make the government look like it was doing something useful. There was a, a uh, University of uh, California biophysicist said the effective dose was 45 times higher than what TSA admitted. There was a PBS investigation that said the scanners could be causing 100 cancer cases per year. Uh, and it's interesting what the TSA based its data on for the radiation exposure and risk. 
uh, let's just say that, the, that almost all the data was from Japan. And almost all of that was based on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, on, on, on the long-term exposure to that. And so, you know, it, it would have been great if people could have put, could put stickers on these scanners, you know, showing a mushroom cloud with a smiley face. <laughs> Because that is basically what the TSA was, was trying to do. Um, you know, TSA was trying, uh, T, you know, it's hard for the TSA to put out a two paragraph statement without lying. I mean, it's just in the agency's blood. And um, one of the things they were trying to do is tell people that, you know, you have nothing to worry about. These are blurry photos. People can't see anything. Well, it, you know, but a lot of court challenges on that show different. The ACLU challenged that. But uh, the, the, uh, my, my favorite example of that going down of the failure of the don't worry, it's blurry defense. There was a TSA screener in Miami who was arrested after he attacked a fellow TSA employee. Uh, TSA agents had been testing the uh, new whole body scanner, getting photographed going, uh, going through the machine before the public was put through it. And there was a brawl, and, and what the uh, police affidavit said, that it, the x-ray showed that the TSA screener has a small penis and his co-workers made fun of him on a daily basis. <laughs> and, and the TSA agent finally lost it and beat up one of his co-workers, and uh, I think he still has his job, actually. But, that's <laughs> but passengers, understandably, were balking at the idea of going through these radiation machines. So people were starting to push back on that. And so TSA came out with what they called enhanced pat-downs. Now the idea of enhanced, it makes it sound like they're doing you a favor. It makes it sound like you're really getting your $2.50 ticket charge for the 9-11 security, like they're really doing you a favor, but that, that wasn't the case. Um, what they did was basically adopt procedures which made a lot of people think that TSA stood for total sexual assault. And what they did was start to have the uh, screeners intentionally touch people's breasts and genitals as a way to intimidate them and to kind of shame them uh, into going through the uh, x-ray machines. You, now, you had some neoconservative writers and one or two senators who said, who said well, it's only a freedom fondle. It, it's not sexual abuse. It's only a freedom fondle. You know, I assume that there aren't any of those kind of folks here. This, 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 uh, this doesn't seem like a freedom fondle kind of group. Um, but there were, there were all kinds of uh, uh, abuses that came out like that. There was a, a, a ABC News producer. She complained, the TSA woman who checked me out reached her hands inside my underwear and felt her way around. It was basically worse than going to a gynecologist. Uh, there was, um, and it, it wasn't just women that were, were targeted. The TSA also showed no respect for the family jewels. There was, a, uh, there was a journalist, Jeffrey Goldberg, did a story about uh, being subject to the pat-downs, and he was, he was interrogating the TSA agent who was, you know, feeling him up, and the TSA agent said that the rules were he had to keep going, going up the thigh until he bumped into the testicles. You know, I don't know what that has to do with flight safety, but it, it's a great way to get people to go through the damn scanners to, to avoid that, that kind of nightmare. Now, TSA's, TSA keeps finding new ways to screw up. And it has some comic value that way. They have something called the Behavior Detection Officers, the BDOs. And they have thousands of these, and, and they're roaming the airports looking at the micro expressions in people's faces. You know, because TSA thinks that simply from a wrinkle of the brow or something like that, that they'll be able to spot terrorists. Uh, they haven't, TSA has a secret list of 94 indicators that indicate treacherous passengers. And CNN, uh, it's a secret list, but CNN got hold of one of them. And one of them was, uh, according to the TSA, someone who is very arrogant and expresses contempt against airport passenger procedures. <laughs> so I was traveling through Washington National Airport yesterday, going through the TSA, and I had to go through the damn scanner because I was already feeling kind of homicidal. Uh, so. <laughs> And I, and I was standing there, and, and I stepped into it, and, and, and the guy says, um, you got anything in your pocket? And I, I said, not much. He said, you got anything in your pocket? I said, yeah, some papers. He said, well, take them out. Uh, so, I, so, I, so I took out one paper, 
He said, you got anything else? I said, yeah, I got a wallet. Well, take it out. I said, well, I'm not giving it to you. <laughs> you know, I don't trust you. And there was some more back and forth. I basically said, you know, this is all a bunch of bullshit, and y'all are friggin' useless. Um, I didn't get arrested, so that's, that's like six times in a row I haven't got arrested going through TSA. <laughs> but going back, to, going back to this notion that, that people being arrogant and criticizing the passenger procedures is a terrorist warning sign, you know, there, there's no other security agency in the world that thinks it would be terrorists uh, before they attack say, gee, I really hate this security system, you know? It just <laughs> doesn't happen. But TSA is always finding excuses to put its thumb on people. And if someone acts up or speaks back, then, then they're the terrorist suspect. Um, the, the, uh, these, these behavior detection cops core was initially justified to protect Americans against terrorists. More than 100,000 travelers have been referred for additional interrogation in the third degree or search and seizure by these programs since Obama took office. Not a single terrorist has been caught by them. But it's interesting how this, how this program really operates because down in Logan Airport in Boston, two years ago, more than 30 TS agents complained that the behavior detection program has become a magnet for racial profiling targeting not only Middle Easterners, but also blacks, Hispanics, and other minorities. There was the, the, uh, the folks there had a terrorist profile, which, in, which included Hispanics traveling to Miami from Boston, and also blacks who were wearing baseball caps backwards. <laughs> so what was happening was, uh, to justify itself, what this program wanted to do was get a lot more arrests. And so, th so they started making up charges against people. The same thing happened down in Newark. The Newark Star-Ledger reported that the, that the, uh, that the uh, behavior, TSA behavior detection officers there were known by their colleagues as Mexican hunters. Because, because they were all, and, uh, and, and uh, it's, it's worse elsewhere because out in Honolulu, the other TSA agents called these behavior guys Mexicutioners. Because they were always targeting Mexicans and other Hispanics. Because what they wanted to do was get arrests. And it, you know, targeting those folks, they were most likely to have it, an, an, a, uh, a visa problem or some other immigration status could be arrested. And what they would do is pretend that every person who was arrested was a terrorist act prevented. You know, uh, Something else they would do is also go for bulk cash smuggling to, to find people with money on them and then you know, uh, charge them with being a bulk cash smuggler, which did not used to be a crime until 9-11. But it's, it's one of those things the government adds on so it can take everybody's, uh, take what everybody owns. Now, the, the, the um, Inspector General found that this program is completely useless. Uh, it did not have performance measures. It did not actively assess what it did. It could not uh, assure that it was cost effective. And there was no justification for the program. So TSA expanded it. But, but, but something which is really noxious is, is, a, is a TSA is branching out. It's sort of like a bad franchise. And, and what they're doing now is setting loose their VIPER teams across America. Uh, VIPER stands for Visible, Visible Intermodal Prevention and Response. Uh, this is an acronym that was probably dreamed up by a bureaucrat who overdosed on testosterone supplements. <laughs> but what these VIPER teams are doing, these are teams of... Um, you know, of uh, federal air marshals, explosive canine teams, uh, behavior officers, and other TSA agents out there with bulletproof vests, and they're, uh, and they're uh, swooping down on train stations, bus stations, and other transportation hubs uh, that have nothing to do with TSA's original mission. But these are, these are folks who show up wearing uh, radiation detectors to see if any uh, travelers are smuggling a nu nuclear weapon under their flannel shirt. For instance, in February 2001, Viper dis descended on an Amtrak station in Savannah, Georgia, and started to vigorously search rail passengers as they were exiting the train. Yeah, a, a little bit late for that. So, but they were hassling the hell out of people, making them pull their shirts up, frisking young kids, forcing people to submit to a search before they were allowed to get their luggage. And, e and, and, and even the TSA admitted later that was a cluster screw up. Yeah, well. <laughs> It would have been better if we did it before they got on the train. <laughs> uh, down in Houston, Texas two years ago, a Viper team buttonholed local bus passengers. They were going around, people getting on and off buses. They were being 
They were uh, compelled to be searched, have their bags searched, to have the drug dogs going around them. There was a, a local group complained that Metro police were questioning passengers who left the bus about their destinations and their reasons for riding the bus. They have a lot of underemployed government workers in Houston, apparently. But, but TSA's intervention there was a success because it helped the police catch seven prostitutes. So uh, I guess that's, I was looking for an off-color joke, but since the, the camera is running, I'll, I'll try and keep this high-toned. Um, but, what, but what the TSA is doing, it's establishing a right to accost anybody, anywhere for any pretext. It now claims a right to ban people from traveling anywhere unless they submit to a TSA uh, search. Um, and, but the, the, this is all security theater because, for instance, if, if someone uh, wants to get on the train station and, and they're trying to go here and the TSA team is there and they ban them, well, the person can just go to Manchester and get on the train there. I mean, or, or the person can come back two hours later after the, uh, uh, after the uh, TSA team has left to go to their next circus event. It, it is completely absurd, but what's really ugly on this is it's just training people to be docile. It's trying to make Americans far more servile. Uh, the, 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 even the name Viper uh, is an exercise in, in intimidation. TSA of officials say that the Viper raids are a show of force. But it's not a show of force against terrorists because it, as far as the TSA knows, there aren't any Viper targeted uh, terrorists at the locations they're going to. And TSA often admits this. Well, we're just being careful, you know. Someone said, a professor said, well, this is sort of like throwing rocks up in the air and maybe they'll hit a terrorist. It makes as much sense. But it, it, it's a principle of going someplace to your local store, to this, that, or the other, and all of a sudden you have these federal agents and they're intimidating you, and they're cross-examining you, and they have a right to pat you down. And it's such complete BS, and unfortunately, there's been far too little pushback on that so far. Now, a another example of how the government's been more oppressive since Obama became um, president is looking at what the NSA is doing. Uh, I'm, it's great you had Thomas Drake speaking here. He's a national hero. It's wonderful that he's uh, it's wonderful he stood up the NSA and whipped the federal government in federal court. It, it's so rare for anybody to be able to do that on the charges he was charged with. But uh, Americans owe him a debt of gratitude. I'm glad you've got Trevor Tim speaking here as well. He's done some of the best work of anybody in the NSA for the last several years. But it's, it's interesting, um, back before he was president, Obama was opposed to warrantless wiretapping. Maybe it was coincidental. But, <laughs> Since he became president, he dropped an iron curtain of secrecy around the NSA. And he's made it almost impossible to, uh, uh, to know what the government's doing. But uh, shortly after Edward Snowden started leaking documents, um, one of Obama's first responses was to portray himself as a victim because people have not gotten the full story. You know, and, you know I hear a line like that. It just, you know, it's always nice to read that in the morning paper. It, you know, it, it's better than Cheerios at breakfast. Because it's like, oh yeah, this is, this is going to be a good day. Um, and it, 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 it's interesting, um, so far we're still learning some of the BS the government's up to, but we have learned that the NSA is tracking our movements through cell phones. It's uh, siphoning up their hard drives when people uh, play Angry Birds. And it's even using radio waves to install spyware on computers that are not hooked up to the internet. I mean, that's, you know, that's going too far. Um, now, it, it, it's interesting that Obama's tried to portray this. Well, it's just reasonable steps to protect us, but if you're looking for reasonable, don't look at the NSA, because um, there was a, a leak this summer that showed, showed that, one of the, that, that uh, the, one of the definitions of terrorist suspect the NSA is using is, quote, someone searching the web for suspicious stuff. You search New Hampshire Liberty Forum, there you go. You're in the crosshairs, you know. You, you know, you've, uh, you've chosen to forfeit your privacy. Um, a, another area that Obama is horrible on is guns. He's, he's probably the most outspoken anti-gun president in American history. Uh, he's proposed law after law to disarm as many Americans as possible on any pretext. And it's... Now, it doesn't matter if the government is totally incompetent at protecting you. You don't have a right to protect yourself. 
Um, and it's, there's a, there's a federal law that says the, the, the Justice Department is obliged to compile a list of how many Americans are gunned down by federal, state, and local law enforcement. Obama is not willing to follow that law, and that's a huge gap in, in uh, understanding how much peril government uh, really holds for us. I have to say, it's neat to be here in New Hampshire and see a, bunch of, a number of folks in the audience packing heat. Because most places, if I'm talking, the only people who've got guns are government agents. You know, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm always hoping a firefight doesn't start. However, I mean, it's just, it's just good that at least here, that at least they'd be outnumbered here for the first 15 minutes. <laughs> not that I'm encouraging that. Not that I'm encouraging that. Um, it's, I, I want to throw in a word of warning here. Uh, libertarians have become, I, I've, I've seen an ebb and flow over the decades, and it's becoming a little more fashionable now. And, uh, and it's, uh, that's, that's good and bad because it makes it more likely that the feds will target freedom activists for uh, entrapment operations. And I saw that, um, and I, 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 I recall 1996, the National Libertarian Convention was held in D Washington, D.C. And just before the convention started, the, the Justice Department was so proud to announce they had busted a bunch of guys maybe one or two women down in Arizona. Arizona. They had uh, guns they weren't supposed to have, and they were talking about freedom and revolution and all that. It was a complete fabrication by the government entrapments, by, by the government agents. Um, Forty years ago, it was relatively easy to beat an entrapment charge because the, the, there were standards, there were definitions. The courts were a lot more likely to, to use a common sense test. But thanks to the, uh, thanks to the Supreme Court, and to Just Barb and others, it's almost impossible to uh, be, defeat an entrapment charge now. So people should be, uh, be prudent, uh, especially if there are knuckleheads pushing you to do something violent. Because nowadays, a lot of knuckleheads are actually undercover federal agents. And I want to close by saying, uh, if y'all are around tomorrow night, I'm speaking at 5.30 on the topic of libertarian hooliganism. Um, having fun, raising hell for freedom, and, uh, and I'll make sure I'm not wearing a coat and tie for that talk. <laughs> so, thanks very much. Yeah. So I, I heard a little bit of this from another talk, but I was wondering if uh, you have any exact um, uh, court cases about the TSA uh, versus the for Fourth Amendment, if that's ever come up. Um, you know, what, you're not allowed to be searched without probable cause. And uh, to me, it's a very glaring error on that whole agency. Uh, well, it's not just the agency, it's the entire government. Uh, yeah. there, there's a case. John Corbett, a uh, software engineer out of New York, I think he's a software engineer, has been pushing the uh, TSA in federal court. I think he's got his oral arguments coming up pretty soon. And uh, he was the guy who made the video th to show how to, uh, how to evade the, uh, the whole body scanners and smuggle weapons through them. And he's, he's had some great filings in his court case. Uh, what the TSA does, it claims it's at, in, in an administrative search. So therefore, you don't have any constitutional rights. It's completely dishonest. Um, it's a shame there aren't more honest federal judges, but, but honest people don't tend to get confirmed by the U.S. Senate for judges. So, but there, the, the Corbett case, there have been some others. I think the ACLU has done a little bit on this. Uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, I think, has done some good stuff. There is a federal register notice that the, got, that the uh, TSA got their butts whipped in federal court, and they finally had to accept public comments on this new scanner system and their, their standards for, and the way that they screen uh, customers. And they uh, got a tidal wave of 5,000 comments, almost all of them totally anti what, what they were doing. Uh, TSA has to respond to that. It could be coming out any time, or maybe it'll come out in five years. Uh, so, but I mean, it, it's something that people have pushed back in. This is a huge area of BS, and it's frustrating because, um, I, you know, I can understand why folks would say, well, you need some reasonable standard, but as soon as you, as soon as you concede that, the TSA becomes completely unreasonable. 
and, and, and ends up squeezing uh, boobs and balls for no reason. So. Um, the, I, I, uh, okay, I'm, I'm sure a number of people have challenged this in the federal court. Uh, as far as I know, the, the Corbett case is the only one that's made it this far. And I think his oral arguments are coming up in June or July. Uh, he's actually got a, got a very good website. I think it might be called TSA Out of Our Pants. So <laughs> he's good. He's fun. He's a, he's a live wire. So, yeah. Jim, two quick comments and a question. The comment is, um, you were talking earlier about militants, and it's interesting because when the, uh, the Pentagon was briefing the news folks on how to discharge the news, they said any males over the age of 18, 21, over the age of, eight, of 21, will be referred to as militants, even if they're members of the wedding party that Military you're talking age about. Military-age males, yep. Yes. It, it, it was the same stand the U.S. Yeah. used in Vietnam to justify killing rice farmers and others. Sure, and, and then in 1900, there was a standing order by a general officer in the Philippines where any male over the age of 10, not bearing arms, but over the age of 10, because he was capable of bearing arms, could be shot on sight. And, and the other comment I had was, and you and I had a brief discussion about this, there's this popular notion that 5,000 Americans have been killed by cops since 2001. There's a uh, researcher out there who in one year, in a one-year survey, discovered 1,200 with a margin of error of, let's say, 15%, that brings a 12-year total to 17,000 American dead as a result of police. And my question's twofold then. What do you think of that, and what comments do you have about Obamacare? Thank you. Well, uh, for the first question, it's a damn outrage. Um, yeah, I'm, 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 uh, I'm glad. I think I was, I, I did an article for the Washington Times last year on the, um, talking on exactly this issue about the number of people who had been killed by police there were a couple of researchers who I quoted in that. I'm not sure if I quote the guy you're referring to, but certainly uh, 1,200 a year sounds low. I mean, there, there's and a huge frustration here is that when people are killed by the police, the standards for investigation are, are usually like, well, okay, he was killed by the police, so he must have been a bad guy. It, it's the same standard that the U.S. uses for drone victims. Uh, you know, the, 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 the uh, folks were up to no good. Well, he was, he was in that part of Pakistan, and they're all up to no good. And um, I, I read about a lot of the cases where, okay, so there's a questionable shooting, and then it's up to the district attorney to present the case to the grand jury. And the district attorney is like this with the police. And so if you don't have some kind of independent presentation to the grand jury, the, the, the case gets torpedoed there. But there's so often just a, a total lack of um, investigation there. There was a, there was a case of a um, guy with Down syndrome in Frederick, Maryland, lived fairly close to where I lived, who was uh, killed by a couple of police officers because, uh, because he didn't leave his movie theater seat uh, as fast as, as they wanted him, leave, wanted him to leave after the, after the movie ended. Uh, they, were, they, they roughed him up, he ended up uh, asphyxiating. It was ruled a homicide. But in the state of Maryland, if you're a policeman, a law enforcement officer who kills somebody, you can wait 10 days before you answer it. You have a right to wait 10 days before you answer any question. It's called the Law Enforcement Officers' Bill of Rights. And, you know, it's, just, it's such a horrible uh, contortion of the notion of Bill of Rights because you're giving special rights to government agents to kill other people. And, and this has been a known outrage going way the hell back. And um, thanks for the question because it's, 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 it's chilling. Uh, and uh, as, far, as far as Obamacare, um, I'm still against it. <laughs> no, it's an outrage. It's horrible. It's horrible. Um, not good, not good. I mean, it, there's, um, part of it is, I, I think that the procedures for grand juries are structured in a way that give so many advantages to the government. Um, and it, it's been very difficult for cases to get traction. And I would think if you really wanted to bring it down, you would need to do something at the federal level. And uh, I think to, to have a federal, uh, have a grand, to have a, um, to have a, a grand jury that was um, freelancing at the federal level uh, I think that almost never happens. Um, I'm, I'm glad there are a lot of lawsuits percolating against it. There's uh, against some of the abuses. Uh, the, the ACLU has done great work, um, as have some other organizations. Um, 
But it, it's been frustrating that, that the courts have done so little so far to curb the tyranny. And they've just basically changed the definitions and said, well, it's not as bad as it looks. Well, he's president. Well, no shit. I mean, but, you know, back in prior times, simply because you're president didn't mean that it's possible to write out a memo and say, uh, 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 John Smith is a bad guy, let's whack him. I mean, th that was left for the mafia. <laughs> but instead, you have the president now who's, just, uh, who's presumed to have this right. And uh, it's, it's sad to see, you know, it's interesting. I, I, I did a couple books in the 1990s. Uh, well, several books in 1990. One was called Lost Rights to the Destruction of American Liberty in 1994. Another one called Freedom in Chains and came out in the subtitle was The Rise of the State and, and the Demise of the Citizen. And, you know, a lot of people saw those books and said, and asked me, why am I so pessimistic? <laughs> why am I so down? I mean, things couldn't be that bad. And, and I was saying, you know, things, things are not good. Things are, things are a lot worse than what they seem. But even I did not expect things to go this bad this fast. I mean, the whole idea of, of a president uh, having the right to assassinate Americans on his own word and, and people approving that in public polls. Uh, there was a poll that showed there was like 80% approval of that. That's like, you know, no, 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 he's killing people. You know, this is, this is serious. And so often when there are court cases, well, that's a huge thing with this as a question what the government's terrorist batting average is. Uh, the uh, government does a horrible job of accurately identifying who is a terrorist. In, at, right in the six weeks after 9-11, the, uh, the government rounded up over 1,000 people as suspected uh, tie into the 9-11 attacks. None of them were tied in. Uh, first four or five years after 9-11, 90 percent of, of, of the people that were arrested and charged with terrorist cases were not convicted of terrorist offenses. Down there in Guantanamo, you had you know, Rumsfeld saying they're the worst of the worst. Well, it turned out that, like, what is it, almost half of them have been certified to be sent home because, well, the government really didn't have the evidence. So I don't know why folks would simply think the government should be presumed correct when it decides to kill people because the government makes false charges all the time. And that's something that some of the activists here in New Hampshire are doing great work on the local police, on, on, on the false charges that are routine up here. But the same thing happens when you've got federal officials killing people. They make false charges, like, oh, okay, well, he was over 21, so what the hell? So, yes? What can we do to change the, um, the public perspective? Because I know I work in a school, public school. Okay. Whenever I bring up anything, I'm labeled a you know, right wing weirdo or. And, you know, a I'm Mel a Thompson look alike? <laughs> I mean, I've really been trying to change, educate people, but it just isn't happening, especially in Concord, where I live. Okay. Um, you know, uh, I wish I had a really good answer. Uh, I, uh, things like this help because you got more people just talking about freedom and understanding the peril that government poses. Uh, and, and it's a multiplying peril because it, it starts out here, you know, it, uh, it starts out saying that the government, the president has a right to kill terrorist suspects. And then next thing you know, the, uh, the, uh, the, it's going to be the government having the right to kill speeding drivers or the government the right to kill this. So. Uh, speaking out, trying to educate people, trying to inform them, and just holding on, hoping things get better. So, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm being signaled to uh, cut it off, so I'll draw the curtain of mercy. Thanks very much for coming tomorrow at 5.30, uh, raising, having fun raising hell for freedom. <laughs>